see in Hebrews chapter 11 is one big sequence of things that people did by faith. Verses 13 through 16 discuss how they were looking for something that was not temporal, but looking for something that was much more eternal in nature. And when you talk about faith as a construct, that's exactly what we live our whole lives by. It's the belief in things that are not yet seen, the evidence of things that are way out there that are far off in the future. We as Christians live our lives based on the perception of things that are way off after this life is over. We live, we move, we have our being by things that we can't really touch, things that we can't see with our eyes, things that we can't hear, and yet that is the thing that dictates our entire life. Faith is the way that we should live our lives. Faith is the way in which we die. Faith encompasses everything about who we are and what our day-to-day -day operations are. And when you think about what faith is, God asks us to believe a lot of things on faith. He asks us to take a lot of things that are somewhat obscure, somewhat... I'm not going to use the word ridiculous, but it sounds kind of crazy. And he asks us to believe in these things. For instance, he, he asks us to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, a woman who had no relations with any man, and yet somehow conceived not just anybody, but the creator and the Messiah of the entire world. God asks us also to believe that this person walked on water, that he did miracles, that he took five loaves and two fishes and turned them into a feast for 5,000. He asks us to take on faith the fact that this person was died, or that he died, that he was buried, that he was resurrected, came back to life, and that he then ascended into heaven. Something in all these events that none of us have first-hand knowledge of. People say that they saw it. People saw that they witnessed it. People saw it, say that they heard it. But we don't have any first-hand knowledge of those, at least that I'm aware of, unless you're 2,000 years old. And so what God asks us to do is take a lot of these things on faith. Things that we don't see, things that we can't hear, things that we can't touch. And he asks us not only to believe in them, but also to believe in them so much that we would be willing to give our life for them. We live and we move and we operate our entire lives as Christians based on faith. One of those things that he asks us to take on faith because nobody was there. This is something that even if you lived 2,000 years ago, even you didn't see. One of the things that he asks us to take on faith is the creation of this entire world, the creation of the solar system, creation of the entire universe. And there's a lot of people in this world who will testify that they know exactly what happened. I think no matter what your stance is, no matter how right you may be, I think it's a very arrogant type of disposition to have anyways. So people will tell you that they know exactly what happened, that they say this happened and this happened and this follows after that, this caused that, and then all these things happened, and that's exactly the way that it was. The truth of the matter is, Nobody knows exactly what happened at the beginning of the world except for somebody who was there. That person is God. So unless you're God, which I don't see God here. I see God here. That's a metaphor. I should have said that. But unless you are God, unless you were there at the beginning, then you don't know what it was like exactly. And yet God asked us to take, us, take that on faith. And yet God didn't just say, I said something and then it happened and now we're going to move on to the rest of the story. What God did in the first couple of chapters of the book of Genesis is tell us exactly how he created the universe. He doesn't go into the nuts and bolts of it and say, well, then this spun into that and then this created that and then this happened. What he does is he lays out in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 a very step-by-step -step explanation of he spoke and then this happened. He spoke and then this happened. He spoke and then the animals showed up. He spoke and... And then the worlds were separated, the water from the earth. He spoke, and then humans showed up. All these little things that happened. And he asks us to take those things on faith. And there's a lot of people in today's world who will claim to be Christians, who will tell you up, down, left, right, that they believe in God, that they believe in the sacrifice, they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, they believe that the Bible is true, but they don't believe in that. And they can take everything else that seems crazy, that they can believe that this man was born of a virgin and that he was then resurrected after he was killed in the most brutal way possible, that he came back to life somehow and that he then ascended up to heaven and that then spiritual gifts came and did all these things. And they will tell you they have no problem believing that, but they have every problem in the world believing that the world was created in seven literal days. Let me tell you something right now. There's a lot of things that I believe in this world. Some of them have pertinency to what we're talking about this morning. Some of them have to do with my belief that the Red Sox are going to win the World Series this year. But of all the things that I believe, this I think is the most pertinent to today's study. And that is that I believe firmly, without fail, without mention, without any disposition, with any difference in any way, that the earth was created in seven literal 24-hour days. That's what I believe. But I'm also well aware that there are a lot of people who don't believe that. And there may be even somebody in this room today who doesn't believe.
who believes some variation of that, or who believes that in a loose way, or believes that kind of in a metaphorical way, but doesn't necessarily believe in seven 24-hour concurrent days that happened back to back. I don't know of anybody, but it may be somebody in this room that does not believe that. And I'm well aware of that fact. But I want to make you aware, and I want to make you know that this is not where it's at. This is not even on. No wonder you were wondering what was going on. I want you to know, first and foremost, that this is what I believe. There are a lot of people who didn't believe that. A lot of these quote-unquote church fathers that you read about in the history books, a lot of these people didn't believe in this type of thing. People such as Origen and Augustine, people who had a lot of fantastic things to say, were not always right on a lot of things like any man that can say things that are right, that can say a lot of things that are wrong. Origen and Augustine didn't believe that the world was created in seven literal days. They'll tell you that it was a metaphor for things. They'll tell you that it was an allegory for something that was much bigger than that. But they'll tell you that God really never meant to convey the idea that it was created in seven literal 24-hour days. On the other side of that, there's a lot of people who do believe that. As far back as the church fathers, you have people such as Eusebius. You have people such as Clement of Alexandria. You have these people who are very scholastic, very academic-minded people. Jerome is one of them. More recently, people such as Martin Luther and John Calvin, people who had a lot of good things to say, a lot of things that weren't so good, but believe firmly that the world was created in seven literal 24-hour days. And there's a lot of people kind of on both sides of this fence. And for those people who don't believe in the creation of the world in seven literal 24-hour days, they have a whole bunch of different hypotheses and with which to elaborate on these things. People that believe in things such as the day-age theory that believe that these 24-hour days are nothing more than a metaphor for a billion years, or a million years, if you want to use a much more concise construct, and say that each day really represented a long period of evolution, and then the next day started. There'll be people who will say, well, I believe in the gap theory, and that is there was one 24-hour day in which God spoke something, and then there was a million or 10 million or 50 million years in between those days. And so that's another thing. There are other people that believe that maybe that God created the world in seven literal 24-hour days, but that he created it an older version, that he created an already evolved world. And I think there might be a little truth to that. I don't think that that's certainly in the way that a lot of people use that. I don't believe that that's true. But people come up with all different kind of constructs to try and identify or try to say that this is exactly what happened, and they deviate from the central point that no matter what way you look at it, no matter what way you slice it, the earth was created in seven literal 24-hour days. That's what God said. I also believe a couple other things. I also believe that every man and woman on this earth descended from Adam and Eve. I believe that firmly. Notice I didn't say Adam and Eve, and then also Cain, Abel, and Seth, because the text clearly indicates that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters besides just those three individuals. But every man, woman, and earth, or man, man and woman on this earth descended from Adam and Eve, that they are the common ancestor for all of us. I also believe firmly that the flood was global and literally changed the landscape of the entire world. People, I think, in today's world that don't take the biblical creationistic account literally, they say, well, maybe it just rained a lot, and then it all just kind of went away. But if scientists were to actually look, and there are scientists that look at the flood that it, as an actual event that changed the landscape of the world, that waters came up from underneath the ground, that waters from the top came down, and that the earth was literally split and changed the topography of the earth, that it was a cataclysmic event. I believe that in exactly the same way that the scriptures teach it. I also believe firmly that I'm not a scientist. This will probably become not much of a shock to anybody here, but I am not what you would term as a scientist. I don't do well with chemistry. I don't do well with biology. I don't do well with pretty much any of the sciences except the social sciences, well, those things. But I'm not here describing these things to you as somebody who has studied in the field, as somebody who has spent years digesting this and years looking at that. If you're looking for somebody like that, I would encourage you to turn tune into a broadcast that's going to be on downroad.com. It's a church that's down in Beaumont. One of the a president of a college down in Florida who was a Harvard-trained chemist and has spent his life debating evolutionists. He's going to be presenting some information on creationism on that night. I would encourage you to look at that. If you want more information, I can tell you about that later. But if you're looking for somebody who has spent their entire life studying creationistic, evolutionist type differences, I'm not that guy. What I'm presenting here this morning is pretty much the extent of my knowledge. So I encourage you to look at that tonight, or ask Paul. He seems to be pretty well versed in it as well. I also believe firmly, and this is probably a different thing, but I believe firmly that God does not ask him to believe, or us, to believe in him blindly. When God says in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, that he created the earth in seven literal 24-hour days, I will take him at his word. 
But as just kind of proof of that, when we look at the scriptures, God doesn't insinuate that he wants us to just look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and just go on with our lives. He wants us to look at the universe around us to see these things. For instance, when you look at Acts the 14th chapter and verse 17, as Paul is discussing various things in his sermon, he says, and quite frankly he says this in the middle of the sermon, he says, he did not leave himself without witness. Kind of building on this thought, what Paul is alluding to is the idea that you can look around at the world, you can see the sky, you can see the ocean, you can see the sun, you can see the earth, the leaves, all these things, and you can see that these things were created by somebody. That a creator had some hand in them. That's the whole point that Paul is making there in Acts the 14th, chapter verse 17. Speaking to the church of Rome, in Romans chapter 1, as Paul is discussing kind of the immorality that existed in the world, as he's talking about the Gentiles, he mentions that the Gentiles, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes have been clearly seen, but they designed or they decided not to follow after those things for whatever reason. We can see in the world around us all these different things that are evidence of some kind of creator. I believe it to be God, obviously. But evidence of some kind of creator. And that's what Paul was diving into in Acts chapter 14. That's what he was teaching in Romans chapter 1. That you can't look at the world around us and not at least see that. God did not leave himself without witness. I also believe that contrary to what a lot of us may tend to believe at time, one time or another, that science adds to the evidence of God rather than taking away from it. I've met well-meaning Christians, and I have been this Christian at various times in my life, where I was scared to dive into what science or other things had to say about the universe and about the world, because I was scared that it would conflict with what I believed to be the truth. That if I read that book, or if I took that class, or if I talked to that person, or if I dove more deeply into that subject, that it would somehow crater my faith, and that I would become a less, a less of a Christian than I was originally. And I would eventually become an atheist. What I found out, at least by taking that leap, by indulging those different studies from time to time, and looking at those things, is that all it did was make my faith deeper. Because when I see science, and I see chemistry, which to me might as well be on the moon, I don't know anything about it, but when I see chemical explanations for the reason our world exists, when I see biological explanations, when I see astronomy, I took astronomy class in college, when I see those things, to me, I don't see a random chance in all these different little events that just happen to show up time after time. What I see is the hand of God within our world, acting, living, and moving. As Colossians 1, chapter, or chapter 1 talks about, and everything moves and lives and has their being within God. That's what I see when I look at the world. I see more evidence for God. I see more of a depth, more of a learning, more understanding of God's interaction in this world. So you may ask me the question at this point, why do you believe all this? Why do you believe that the earth was created in the seven literal days? The first and foremost, the reason is because the Bible tells us so. The Bible tells us in plain black and white, not to the red yet, that's in the New Testament, but the Bible tells us plainly that this is exactly how it happened. In Genesis, the first chapter, starting in verse 31, you can look at this if you'd like. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 31. He says, God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There was evening, and there was morning, and there was the sixth day. Now notice how he puts the evening and the morning. That's to make no mistake of the fact that these people thought and believed this to be one single day. One day with a morning, and one day with an evening. In chapter 2 of Genesis, he says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. And by the seventh day, God completed all the work which he had done, and he then rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. When you fast forward in the narrative to Exodus chapter 20, when you look at what he talks about here in Exodus chapter 20, he's hearkening back to the same idea of the six days of work and the Sabbath day of rest happening at the end of it. And in Exodus chapter 20, when he's talking about the Sabbath day, he talks about it in the exact same language. Exodus chapter 20, starting verse 8, he says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male, your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. Now here's the reason why. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And God then rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The Bible is very plain with its interpretation that the earth was created in literal seven 24-hour days. 
When Moses uses it in Exodus chapter 20, when God talks to him about the Sabbath day, and then Moses writes it down, he equates the work week, the six days and the seventh day that you rest, he equates that with the literal week of creation. And so if it's used in that same sense, you can understand that that's why he wants us to look at it that way. That's the way that God did it. That's the way that we want to do it as well. The general date of creation, if you want to get really scientific, and people have looked at the genealogies in Genesis chapter 5 and chapter 11, they've tried to trace it backwards. Bishop Usher was the first one to do this very famously. But as you try to trace it backwards, people have traced the age of the earth, at least to this point, and starting at being around 5500 B.C. That number can vary a little bit. It can be a couple hundred years after. It can be a thousand years below. But that's generally the idea. A man named Beattie, who was a historian, or actually was a Christian historian in the 8th century, actually put an exact day on it. He put it as March, I think, 17th. And he put it as 3952, so we almost celebrated, I guess a couple weeks ago, the birthday of the entire world, according to Beatty. But there are people who would look at this in Genesis chapter 1, look at this in Exodus chapter 20, and say that this is nothing more than an allegory. We've probably met these people before that say, well, it wasn't seven literal 24-hour days. What he was doing was encapsulating it in the way that we would understand it best. The 24-hour days is a nice little neat unit of time. And that helps us understand how God created the world. But it's much more complex than that. I would agree that it's probably much more complex than God spoke and it happened. I'm sure there's a lot that went into those words, a lot that went into the universe. But that's the way that the world, that's the way the Bible dictates it to us. That God spoke and within a day these things happen. When you look at 2 Peter chapter 3, people tend to believe that this idea of not being 24 hour days, literal, it's based on what Peter would say in 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 9. Most of us are familiar with that phrase. When Peter is discussing the long-suffering and the patience of Christ, or patience of God in regards to our salvation, one of the things that Peter says there in 2 Peter chapter 3 is, is he says, for a day is to the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And the way that Peter uses that in 2 Peter chapter 3 is to discuss the longevity or the long-suffering of God, that God doesn't have any discernment when it comes down. He doesn't really care about that. He doesn't care if it takes you a day. He doesn't care if it takes you a thousand years. He will wait as long as it takes for all to come to repentance. We know that that won't ever happen, that everybody won't come to repentance. But that's a description of the long-suffering and the patience that God has. That's a metaphor, in other words. In Psalm 90, he would use it much the same way. Look over there at Psalm 90. The psalmist is writing about this long-suffering of God. Psalm 90. Starting in verse 3, he says much the same type of thing. Psalm 90 and verse 3, he says, You turn man back into dust, and you say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. He's discussing the exact same type of thing. In verse 5, he says, You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they are grass, like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and then it withers away. What he's describing here in a metaphorical sense is the long suffering of God. The exact same type of thing he would discuss in 2 Peter chapter 3. But the Lord doesn't view time as we do. And that's, at least for me, I don't know if it's the same way for you, but for me, that's a hard concept. Because in my mind, I see things happening on Sunday, things that happen on Monday, things that happen on Tuesday. We have a very linear progression of time. And it's crazy to me to think that God doesn't really view it like that. That God dispenses it to us in literal days, in a literal measurement of time. But God doesn't view it like that. A thousand years is one day, days is a thousand years. Whatever it takes for his plan to fully unfold. That's the way that God views time. That's, I think, at least for me, it's a little bit hard. When we talk about this idea of a literal unit of time, people will say, well, it was meant as an allegory, it was meant as a metaphor. God didn't really mean it. But I will tell you this. No matter what we interpret those things in the past to be and how we think that God meant it to be, there's no mistaking the fact that when you look at the book of Genesis and when you look at the creation accounts, the way that it was written by Moses, he intended the reader to see it as the seven literal 24-hour days. Keep this in mind, 357 times outside of Genesis chapter 1, there is a number attached to a day in the Old Testament. Every single one of those 357 times, it denotes a literal unit of time. Let me say that again. The idea of day, that's what a lot of this kind of controversy centers around. 
357 times outside of Genesis chapter 1 in the Old Testament, that word day appears. Every single time it's attached to a number, it always refers to a specific, literal unit of time. Exodus chapter 24 and verse 16 is probably the more famous one. When he talks about how Moses was up on the mountain for six days, and then there was a seventh one right after that. Literal week that he was up on the mountain. Exodus chapter 24, verse 16 is a perfect example of that thing. People in today's world will say, well, God could have done this. He could have spanned it out over a billion years. He could have made it the creation of the world in three and a half billion years. Or he could have made those 24-hour days and then had a billion years in between that. God could have made the earth much more older than it actually was, at least from what it appears to us to be. Are all those things true? Yeah, he could have. He could have created the world any way that he wanted to. But the way the Bible tells us that he created it was in seven literal 24-hour days. And so that's why I believe it. But not just because the Bible tells us so, although that should be good enough for all of us, we also believe that the Bible was created in seven literal days because, quite frankly, science confirms it. This was something that I was very interested in looking into the last couple of weeks because it's one of those things that has been debated so hotly that there's propaganda on both sides. Anybody that was familiar with that Ken Ham and Bill Nye debate that I think happened a few years ago saw that basically what amounted to, that debate amounted to, was talking points on this side and then talking points on that side, and never at any point did they ever actually meet in the middle. They wanted to state their piece, they wanted to state their piece, but there was never any actual debate, there was never actually any discussion going on. And I feel like too often times when we discuss the intersection of faith and science, that's too often times what happens. I have my faith, I have my viewpoint, and it's based on these little talking points. You have your talking points, and that's that. And so what I wanted to do was try to get outside of those more common narratives and try to find things that actually provide substantive evidence that the earth is actually only six or 7,000 years old, that it was created, the birthday was in 5,000 B.C. or 5,500 B.C., and I found some things that I thought were very interesting. First and foremost, any of these soft tissue fossils. It's a T-Rex that was discovered in Montana not long ago. And what they found when they sliced open the bones of this T-Rex, and everybody believes that it was a T-Rex. What they found when they sliced open the bones of this T-Rex that everybody also agreed was 65 million years old. What they found when they spliced open that bone was living protein. They found arteries that were still, that could still pump blood. They found collagen. They found these things that were inside that over the course of 65 million years would have certainly been passed away. These things were still very much active. The only problem was they were frozen. And so they astounded pretty much everybody when they looked at this. They said there's no way that something like this could actually exist. And yet when they cut open this T-Rex leg, which I'm sure the T-Rex probably didn't appreciate that too much. But when they cut open that T-Rex leg, they found things that should have been died out or should have died out centuries, millennia ago. <coughs> it was still there, very much active. Another thing that I think was interesting, or I thought was interesting, was this idea of the faint sun paradox. And what this, in essence, teaches, and there's a lot of science in this that we don't have the time to get into, that I quite frankly don't understand that well, but basically what it teaches, after a couple hours of reading up on it, what it teaches is that the sun gets progressively hotter, that the helium and all these different elements inside of it compact with each other, and so the sun, over time, is continuing to get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. 35 or 3.5 billion years ago, when the earth was supposedly created, the earth, according to this paradox, would have been 25%, overall, would have been 25% less warm than it is right now. And if you look at the average temperature, if you look at the earth's temperature, take that 25% off, what that does is place the temperature of the earth at the time of its creation as being below freezing in an environment where life simply could not have existed. And scientists on both sides of this are puzzled because they want to accept this three and a half billion years old date, but there's simply no way, astronomically speaking, that life could have existed that far back. Could it have been three billion years ago? Maybe. But not at least at a three and a half billion year old mark. We also see, this is something I thought was very interesting. The Axel Heiberg and the Ellesmere Islands that are found just south of the Arctic Circle, just north of the Arctic Circle. These are places that for most of the year, I think 10 months out of the year, life almost can't exist. It's up in the Nordic, the Netherlands area. Life almost can't exist because it's just so cold up there. And yet what they found when they started going to this tundra and started cutting open slices of ice and they started peeling back these layers, what they discovered <coughs> were trees. 
And not just any trees, and not petrified trees, but fruit trees. Trees that had leaves and had fruits that were native to tropic areas. And this was not petrified wood that was just kind of a rock at this point. You throw it. This was wood that once it was de-iced, you could literally carve it up and use it as firewood. What that denotes is something that's much more recent, the fact that it got there, its positioning there was much more recent than three and a half billion years. But also the bigger question of how in the world did a fruit tree get all the way up in the Netherlands? I don't have an answer for that. Scientifically speaking, I think the Bible is very clear when we discuss the impact of the global flood on the entire world. This last one is something much more in my wheelhouse that I love, but the existence of human records that, to me, speak not only to the date of the earth, but also speak to the arrogance of human nature. If we, if actually, if mankind, let's put it that way, if mankind is correct in saying that the world has existed for three and a half billion years, and that Homo sapiens came onto this earth, at least prim climbed out of the primordial ooze or whatever it was that created them, they came around 200,000 years ago then what their essence teaching us or telling us is that mankind existed for almost 185 or 190,000 years before mankind ever had the thought in their head to write something down. Human history only started in the first recorded date, 1819 BC, and human history at large only was really recorded with cave paintings and drawings a couple thousand years before that. So what you're telling me is, evolutionist number one, what you're telling me is, is that mankind existed for 190,000 years and not once did anybody ever think to themselves, maybe I should write my day down. Maybe I should write down what I did today. When you look at the progression of human history from the time of 5000 BC, the ancient Mesopotamians, Egypt being that first global empire, when you look at the speed with which humanity has progressed over the last 5,000 years, and you take that back even another 5,000 years, at that rate, we should be living on Pluto right now. And you're telling me that we've been here for 200,000 years and we haven't been writing anything down? To me, that not only speaks to the condescension of this world, what C.S. Lewis would call chronological snobbery by the fact that we think we're superior than people in the past purely because we live in a later age. It also speaks to the senselessness of these ideas. That people existed for three and a half billion years, humanity existed for 200,000 years, and nobody really thought to do anything about it. To me, and this is why I mentioned the first, I'm not really a scientist. I don't have scientific explanations. I listen to the Bible, I read the Bible, this is what makes sense to me. But to me, these are questions, quite frankly, that need answers. And that up until this point in the scientific community, I have not found any good answers. I mentioned at the beginning that I don't believe that God asks us to believe blindly in things that he told us. I still believe that. When he tells us the creation of the world, when he tells us the resurrection of Jesus, when he tells us about these things, to a certain point, he's not asking us to take things on faith. The essence of faith is to believe in the things that you can't touch, the things that you can't quantify. But you don't have to look very far in the historical records of the first century to find numerous accounts of somebody named Christos. You don't have to look very far back to see records, like we talked about here, of the earth existing, not 2.5 or 3.5 billion years, but a much younger earth. And to me, whenever you look at the scriptures, if you're going to take these things about the resurrection of Jesus, and you're going to take these things, the miracles, all these things that exist in the Bible, and then you're going to make the creation of the world be a moot point. I don't believe in that. To me, you've lost your faith before you even got on page 3. The question then becomes, when we look at all of this, and this, is, I guess, is the big question. After all of these evolutionary thoughts, the question to me has always been, where did life originate in the first place? Even Darwin in his Origin of Species, that great, trans not great, but that transformative book that was written about 120 years ago, when Darwin called the book The Origin of Species, never once in his book, The Origin of Species, did he ever actually talk about the origin of species. He talked about how this life form came from this species, that this species erupted out of this life form, but never at any point in it did he discuss that single cell organism, that bionuclear matter that spawned life in the first place. 
And as far as I can tell, whenever you look at numerous things that the world writes on it, nobody has any good explanation for it. So the question is, you can talk about evolutionary processes, you can talk about these things and that things, you can talk about everything that happened after point A, but if you can't describe to me the originating event like the Bible can, I just, I can't hear that. Because it's all based off of suppositions and presumptions about what I think happened. It's purely speculation. The ultimate question after all of this is really, why does any of this matter in the first place? Why do we spend, I know it may feel like 30 hours, it's only been 30 minutes. The question is, why did we spend any time discussing this in the first place? Quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, with as predominant as it is in the world around us, we need to spend at least a little bit of time talking about it. But there's a bigger issue. Number one, if we can't accept what God says about this world, how can we believe what he talks about the next the first couple pages of our Bible that we take and that we live and we die by tell us the way the world spun into existence, the way the world was created. And if I look at those first three pages and I read all about the days and about the, the species that existed and here's where mankind came from, here's where woman came from out of man, if I read all that and I think of it nothing more than a metaphor, I think about it nothing more than an allegory, or I think that God, for whatever reason, didn't really mean what he said. As I mentioned earlier, I've already lost my faith, and I'm not even on page three. How am I ever going to believe that the resurrection of Jesus actually happened? How would I not look at that, or what's to stop me from looking at that and thinking at some point, that's nothing more than a metaphor, or that's nothing more than an allegory? And what's to say that heaven is nothing more than just a, a metaphor for my perfect life if I live according to this world. If we don't believe what he said about this world, how are we ever going to believe what he said about the days? John MacArthur is one of the foremost speakers, at least in the realm of Christianity today. I, don't, I, I like a lot of stuff he has to say. It's like a lot of people. I like a lot of stuff he has to say. Not everything. But he had this thing I thought was very interesting. He says, if you reject the creation account of Genesis, you have no basis for believing the Bible at all. If you doubt or explain away the Bible's account of the six days of creation, where do you put the reins on your skepticism? Do you start with Genesis 3, which explains the origin of sin? Or maybe you don't sign on until sometime after chapter 6, because the flood is invariably questioned by scientists too. Or perhaps you find the Tower of Babel just too hard to reconcile with the linguist theories of how languages originated and evolved. So maybe you start taking the Bible as a literal history, beginning with the life of Abraham. But when you get to Moses' plagues against Egypt, will you deny those too? What about the miracles of the New Testament? Is there any reason to regard any of the supernatural elements of biblical history as anything other than poetic symbolism? I love this last clause. If we're worried about appearing unscientific in the eyes of naturalists, we're going to have to reject a lot more than just Genesis 1-3. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the truth. The way that false doctrine comes into this world comes about because people see things in the Bible and for one reason or another, they just simply can't get past it. They cannot believe that baptism is the vehicle by which sins are washed away. Not just getting wet, but the appeal is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 talks about the appeal of God towards a good conscience. They can't believe that you can just pray to God for forgiveness and repent of those sins and everything's forgiven. And so because of that disbelief in what he says, rationalization starts to set in. And we begin to say to ourselves, well, there's no way he could have actually meant that. Here's what he actually means. And if we do that with something like Genesis 1 through 3, then what's to stop us from doing it from, with every other passage in the Bible? I appreciate Luke reading from us this morning from 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I love what 16 says, because it says that every passage of Scripture is breathed to us from God. And if God didn't mean that the world was created in seven literal 24-hour days, then don't you think that he would have stated it something differently? Let God, let God be true, and let every man be found in That's what I believe, first and foremost, because the Bible tells me. If you're here this morning, for some reason, you're looking at the things that God has to say about baptism, about forgiveness, about prayer, about obedience, and you're just thinking to yourself, well, I can't actually name that. I would encourage you to read it again. Because if God had wanted something other than the things that he specified, he would have specified things other than that. When he says baptism, he means it. When he says prayer, he means it. When he says repentance, when he says obedience, he means it. I would encourage us to start looking.
If you have any need of the gospel call, why don't you come? Please stand with us.